Hi, and welcome to the Seek Sustainable Japan podcast. This is JJ Walsh, your host here in Hiroshima, Japan. And in this episode, I'm catching up once again with craft beer brewmeister and insider on the craft brewery scene in Japan, Sakamichi Brewery's own co founder, Matthew Boynton. Now, Matthew、uh, shares in this episode his North to South Japan craft breweries from the tap room top 10 list with us. Lots of great examples and updates on Matthew's own Sakamichi Brewery since we last talked during COVID. A lot of things have changed, a lot of great new strategies、uh, to collaborate with other eateries and businesses in their area. And really create a community, not just a brewery, not just a tap room. And he talks about the passion that he and a lot of other brewers have, not only for the trade, but for community. It's a great conversation. And you will also notice that Matthew has a fantastic radio voice. Well, he is also a podcaster. So if you're interested in checking out Sakamichi Nights, That is the regular show between him and his fellow co founder as they talk about the latest brews they have on tap, which you might be interested in. So, I hope you enjoy the episode. And、uh, if you enjoy the episode, please share it and like it. Thank you so、With、much. The amazing Matthew Boynton. Thank you so much for joining again. Good morning, JJ. Thank you very much for having me on. Now, it's been two years since we last talked. and Uh, things have really changed, I imagine. We're going to talk a little bit of catch up on how things have changed at Sakamichi Brewery. And、uh, you're in the Tokyo area. Just give us a little background introduction of where you are and how you started brewing. That's a long story, but at least where you are. <laughs> That is a bit of a long story. Well, we are in、uh, Tachikawa, which is in the west of Tokyo. Um, it's about, well, if you get the express train, it's about 27 minutes、uh, from Shinjuku to Tachikawa.、Uh, and I like to think of this as kind of the gateway to the Tama region、uh, west of Tokyo. So, further west of us, you've got the mountains up in Okutama, you've got the Tama River, you've got Hachioji up there. I was actually just up by Mount Takao yesterday, enjoying some nice autumn leaves. So, we're kind of halfway between. Central Tokyo, Shinjuku, places like that, and the west and the mountains out here in Tachikawa. Nice. And、uh, we talked、uh, for the first time on the show about how you and your co founder、uh, met through cycling and、uh, going up lots of hills and steep areas. And that gave you the idea for the name of your brewing. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Sakamichi Brewing. Sakamichi means like steep road, mountain road. And、uh, me and Dan met through cycling, cycle touring.、Uh, and so we enjoyed enjoying a restorative beer after climbing up a, a steep hill or even going down a steep hill on the other side.、Uh, and we also felt that the process of starting our own brewery in Japan was going to be a fairly steep road. And spoiler alert, we were not wrong. It, it has been a steep road. Yeah,、uh, you were talking last time about lots of paperwork for、uh, brewing your own beer, and you weren't actually brewing your own beer yet,、uh, but you are now. Is that that's, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah.、Um, the, the Japanese government loves paperwork.、Um, I, I'm pretty sure they're eating it. That's why they need so much of it. But、um, we got our brewing license finally、uh, last November, November 2022. And so we've been brewing for about 12 months now. In our facility here in Tachikawa. That's awesome. How has your local brew、uh, competed with a lot of the brews that you have on tap in your tap room or the, the canned brews that you have from other parts of Japan or even internationally? Yeah, we, we do sell、uh, still some guest beers from other breweries in Japan or sometimes internationally as well. But、um, we have 12 taps in our tap room here. And at the moment, 10 of them are beers that we have made, either here or in collaboration with other breweries. And I think part of what brings people to craft beer is authenticity. You know,、um, it's, 
it's pretty easy to find lots of things that are delicious to drink and, and will get you drunk here in Japan. But if you're sitting here in our tap room, you can actually look through the window and see the facility where we make it. If you're here early enough in the day, you might even be able to see me sweating away back there trying to make the beer. Uh, and that, that authenticity, I think, is a real key part of why people come to craft beer. And so being able to, to drink the beers that were made in the place is a big draw for people, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And the connection to your local community. Last time we were talking about uh, one of the things you learned from Baird Brewery, where you did your training, uh, was how to support local eateries. And you, you had people uh, invited them to bring their food from local eateries, which is a great collaboration with your area. Uh, is that something you're still doing? Yeah, that's right. Um, so we don't cook any, prepare any food here in uh, our tap room, but people are free to bring in whatever food they want from other restaurants, uh, places around Tachikawa. There are lots of good restaurants in Tachikawa. And actually recently we've started uh, working together with an izakaya that's just right opposite us, right across the street. And we have a menu from them on the bar and customers can just call them up and say, hey, I want some fried chicken and some uh, some potato fries and they will actually bring it over to the table for you so we don't prepare food in here but we're trying to find ways of expanding the kind of food that people can order while they're in here that's awesome and uh wouldn't it be great if they serve it on reusable plates and bento in fact boxes? in fact they do you that that is uh the way that they do it they bring it over in a kind of little basket thing uh, which um, we collect behind the bar. And then when they bring over the next order, we we send the baskets back uh, and they circulate back and forth across the street. That is awesome. I love that. I love that. Why why should you make your own kitchen and and do substandard? Oh, maybe you would do standard or have better. <laughs> but, um, you know, if someone's already there and you can work together, that's, that's a win-win. Absolutely, yeah. And our speciality is beer. And we want to just focus on making great beer and serving great beer. And we'll leave producing great food up to somebody else who has that speciality. That's awesome. Now you're in your uh, Sakamichi Brewing uh, tap room right now. And That's you right. said the, the brewery is right behind you. And uh, the road next to you, we might hear some ambulances because your podcast is famous for a bit of siren action, right? It, it is a bit, yeah. I'm sandwiched between a brewery with lots of noisy equipment on my right and a busy morning road on my left. So you might hear a little bit of background noise. Um, but yeah, we, uh, me and, and Dan have been doing a podcast for some time called Sakamichi Nights. And I think in every single episode, because there's a hospital right up the street from us, you will be able to hear at least one ambulance go past. Usually we try and pause to let it go, go past and edit it out later. Um, but uh, yeah, it's part of our sound, part of the, the audio landscape of our podcast, I think. And I think it's a selling point for a, a brewery, isn't it? Uh, having somewhere, if you drink just way too much, you could stumble in, get some treatment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Or, we're also, or maybe not. Yeah. We're also <laughs> right up the street from uh, an animal hospital. So you could kill two birds with one stone there. You could take oh, your dog wow. to the vet and then you can... Uh... <laughs> and hopefully not kill the bird. Yeah. I, yes. <laughs> yeah, that was perhaps a poor choice of metaphor. <laughs> It is uh, um, fun to sit yeah. in the window, though, and see people carrying their interesting pets up to the hospital. There's a lady who has a, a plastic backpack full of weasels that goes past sometimes. Oh, my gosh. Do you ever entice her in for having a drink and seeing the weasels after the visit? She looks like she has her hands full already. I'm not sure if I want to add anything else to her day, to be honest. But a lot of cafes and bars are more pet friendly right now. Are you allowing people to bring their dogs in while they have a pint? Uh, I think it, we, we don't have a specific rule. I think it kind of depends on how busy it is. If it's totally packed, it's standing room only and somebody shows up with a, an Akita that they're almost riding like a dog instead of, or riding like a horse instead of walking like a dog, that might be a tricky situation for us. But if it's a quiet afternoon and somebody has a small quiet dog, sure, yeah, bring it in. I know that the place across the street, Motoya, the one who provide the food for us, they do have a very specific uh, pets are allowed during the day, but not in the evening rule. I think there's a specific cutoff time for dogs there. Wow. That's it. Well, that's great. You got pet friendly 
area. Um, I'm sure summer is the height season for drinking beer. Is that right? Were you the busiest in summer? Um, I, th I think so. Uh, craft beer tends to be an all year round kind of thing. Uh, we certainly had a lot of events during the summer. That is true. Um, where we'd be going out and serving beer um, in a local park or a shopping center or something like that. Um, but we're coming up to uh, Bonenkai season now, which is uh, usually a big one for, for restaurants and bars. Um, that's the forget the year parties that people like to have. Uh, and because we don't do food, we're maybe not a first stop on something like that, but we might be a second stop or even a third stop for some people's Bonenkai's. And it looks like you've got some merch behind you. Is that your own designs? The T-shirts? Yeah. Yeah, we have a, a variety here. Um, most of them are our own designs. Actually, this white one just over my shoulder here was designed by one of our regular customers. Goes by the name Crazy Tanaka. And she uh, she was very kind enough to, to design this T-shirt for us. But yeah, there's a variety here behind me. Nice. And it looked like I came across on your Twitter, you had some fan art. <laughs> is that what this is? Uh, this is some art done by a brewery in Ohio, in the States, uh, to commemorate a beer that we made together. Actually, it's a collaboration beer. Um, the brewery is called Old Capital Brewing, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but I think the town is called Chillicot, Chillicotti, uh, which used to be the capital of Ohio State. Um, but anyway, one of the owners there is uh, married to a Japanese lady, and he sometimes comes over to Japan. And we got to talking, and we agreed that we would make a beer together. They're from Ohio, so it had to be a breakfast stout, and we had to call it Ohio Gozaimas. Uh, and he actually brought over the coffee from America that we used in making that beer. And his house artist put together this, this wonderful manga-inspired art for us as well. I love that. And that's you and the co-founder on the bottom corner, right? That's right. Yes. And Seth, the uh, the owner from Old Capital Brewing together with us. Oh, awesome. That's so nice. I love, I love all the art of the different cans. And I think, you know, like I used to, and I think I still do choose wine by the label. Do you find people coming in and choosing a beer because of the great art on the can? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I encourage it. Um, people sometimes are standing in front of the, the showcase fridges and they're not sure what to choose. They, they don't really have a clear idea about what they want. And I tell them, well, look, they're all good. So just pick one with a label that you like, and I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy it. Um, I guess they say the first sip is with the eye as well. Very nice. Um, I was interested in this two rabbits beer. Um, they've got great labels with a koala and a rabbit here riding a bike. Is this a Japanese brand? Yeah, they're a Japanese brewery. They're in uh, Omiya Hachiman uh, in Shiga Prefecture, just on the, the shores of Lake Biwa. Um, but the, the, the founder of the brewer uh, is uh, an Australian, New Zealand guy. Um, so they've brought in the, the koala to their, their rabbit branding, uh, and they're both riding a tandem there together. It's very cute. That's awesome. And this Amendment Brewery uh, designs are awesome. A lot of Lincoln and Statue of Liberty, very American theme. Very American, yes. <laughs> 21st Amendment, which uh, I'm not 100% on my American political history, but I think that was the amendment that abolished prohibition. Is that right? Am I making that up? I I'm sure somebody will correct me in the comments if I'm getting yeah. that wrong. Yeah, please correct us. I'm sure other people would know. I'd have to check that myself. Um, Jen says she's frozen. We'll come back later. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> Lord Crunk uh, sounds delicious, he says, from YouTube. Thanks for joining, guys. If you have, oh, she's back. Great to have you back, Jen. Uh, if you've got any comments or questions, we'll look forward to that along the way, as usual. Um, this one I was really surprised about. Tell me about udon brewing my goodness you've got noodles kitsune and tanuki udon style beers what's going on uh i hate to be the bearer of bad news here but these cans do not actually have any udon noodles in them it's just delicious beer so you might be disappointed you might be wonderfully surprised when you crack one open but uh yeah udon brewing is a, a brand of a, a brewery called seto uchi which is uh down in shikoku um, I was there last year, actually, I think. Uh, and they make all kinds of excellent 
uh, hazy IPAs. That's that's their main thing. Well, that looks great. I, I see uh, Setochi beer on the label there, hojicha ale. So hojicha is a kind of tea. Right, um, yeah, roasted tea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how interesting. Now, uh, we talked last time about how a uh, craft brewery is sort of like, how is it classified as craft beer? Mm. Uh, you were talking about getting your license for haposhu, which is a, a different classification. Um, can you just explain that a little bit before we go forward? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, you need a, a license to brew alcohol in Japan, to brew beer. Uh, and for craft beer breweries like us, you can choose between either getting a beer license or getting a haposhu license. And the biggest difference between those is that for the, the minimum output requirement is different. The tax office requires you to produce a minimum amount of, of what you're making. So for a beer license, you have to make 60,000 liters a year. But for a haposhu license, you only need to make 6,000 liters a year. And these can be functionally basically exactly the same products. Um, for us, the only real difference is that we add um, a kind of seaweed extract to help to clarify the beer. And if we add that during the boiling process, then the product is haposhu. If we were to add it during the whirlpool process, it would be beer. So it's the same ingredients, but the process is very, very slightly different. And that is enough to change it from beer to haposhu in the eyes of the tax office. That is bizarre. That is so weird. And you said also if you add uh, one seed of coriander, one non, you know, like alternative ingredient, can we yeah. call them? Um, <laughs> um, that, I, that would make it haposhu. That used to be the case, okay. but the law has been updated since then. So the list of authorized beer ingredients now contains uh, spices, coriander, um, fruit, as long as you don't change the fundamental nature of the fruit, I think is how they put it. So if you peel it, that's still fruit. But if you were to candy it, okay, that's now something different. And if you put it in, that would be haposhu. So like a salted caramel beer, that would be haposhu. Because that's you're... I think that would be delicious. Yes. <laughs> and it would also, it would also be haposhu. Yes. If you put salt caramel into it. Wow, how interesting. And um, so you were talking about getting the license and now you are brewing your own beer. Last time uh, you were doing a phantom brewing. That's so right. using other people's setups is very expensive. If people are thinking about starting their own craft brewery, that's one of the biggest costs, right? Uh, to get set up, yeah to, yeah, to to buy all the equipment and to get it into the facility and so on. And it's a it's a somewhat fraught process as well because as the delivery guy, in order to be able to apply for the license, you have to have a brewery. So you have to have spent that money already. And then the, the gaining of the license is not guaranteed. So you could find yourself in a terrible limbo situation where you have invested all this money in a big brewing system, but then you're unable to get a license to actually make beer with it. Oh, and you told me before we went live that uh, last time we talked about when you did your training with Baird Brewery, uh, you had to climb in and clean out the hops and you don't have to do that for your system. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, one of the very unique things about Baird Brewing that makes their beer, um, you know, very unique and special in Japan is that they only use whole flower hops, whole cone hops. Uh, and those give a really nice uh, character to their beer but they are more difficult to work with. Um, we use pelletized hops uh, and they basically turn into a slurry when you add them to the wort. And so when you're done, you can basically flush them down the drain. You can't do that with whole cone hops. You have to actually get in there and dig them out with a, a bucket and a sieve. Wow. Uh, great comment from Lord Crunk here, just talking back of the, the beer udon, the noodle beer. A can of udon with a can of beer sounds great. <laughs> Maybe that could be a, a gimmick from your izakaya next door. They could have a can of udon you could have next to your can of beer. Often and, in the um, convenience store, they do have the, the warmer, don't they? You can buy a hot bottle of tea. If there were cans of udon in broth in a nice warmer in the, the convenience store, you could pop one open and just slam it back on the way to work. Hey, 
Uh, we're, we've, we're inventing new products right now. Let, let me email that to myself quickly. <laughs> That's mine. That's mine. I own that. That's awesome. Now, speaking of cans, uh, that was one of the things we talked about in the last time we talked about the ability to can your draft beer if people wanted to do take out or take home. Um, and you talked about the need to get inside a plexiglass box to do it uh, because that was a different style of paperwork hell or something? Yeah, I think um, the issue there is that the, the the place where you package the beer has to be separate from the place where you serve the beer. They have to be in different rooms. Um, but some people do have like a, a countertop a can seamer or a, a growler filler or something like that. So in order to fulfill this requirement, that has to have some kind of box around it. And when you close the door of that plexiglass box, that then becomes a separate room that you can package the beer in uh, into a crowler or a growler or something that somebody has brought in for themselves even. So even to fill like a growler that I brought of my own, you would have to have that separate room. Because I have seen some craft breweries like in Miyajima, they just put it in a plastic cup and people can take it to go. Right. But using the growler or the crowler is different. Yeah, I would uh, want to avoid using single-use plastic cups yes, wherever we yes, could. Yes. Um, some places will uh, package their own pet bottles for people to take away as well. Gross. I'm not really wanting to put that much plastic out into the world. You know, I understand places that do it, but it's not something that we do. We would rather use something recyclable or reusable, like a glass growler or an aluminium crowler. Um, I think it is something of a, a legal gray area. Um, so I wouldn't want to comment on what any individual brewery is doing. It might be a case of nobody stopped us, uh, so we continue to do it. Um, but the the beer that is sold to be consumed on site is licensed by the health office, and beer that is sold to be taken away is licensed by the tax office. So it might fall into sort of a, a bit of a gray area between those two different regulatory bodies. And you were saying last time that as you were doing the paperwork, you would often have to relay information between those two offices. Especially if they didn't agree with each other. And I'd have to say, well, these guys told me this. Okay, right. Well, I'll go and tell them that. Can I? Can you not pick up the phone for yourself? Oh. They all work for the same government. <laughs> now, um, before I forget, uh, one of the things I brought up last time was about how some beer is not vegan. And uh, you were saying the kind of filter that you use is from seaweed. So all of your beers that you make is vegan. Is that right? Uh, yes, that is correct. Uh, I suppose it depends how strictly you want to be vegan. How about yeast? Yeast yeah. is uh, we said a that last time. Yeah. But I would argue that uh, mm. mushrooms, which are fungi, yep. are, are considered one of the staples of the vegan diet. So yeah, yeast, I think, would classify similar to fungi, don't you think? Yeah, yeah they, they are basically a, a kind of fungus, a kind of microorganism like that. So in that case, totally fine. Yeah, our clarifying chemicals are based on seaweed. But uh, there is, you had a great episode with uh, Casey of the Bean Pod, uh, drinking some horrifying beer, which everybody tries to avoid uh it does end up in people's fridges when you have parties usually people bring it and then they drink the good stuff and they right. leave it there um but you guys were drinking that i won't you i'll link to your episode you people can listen if they're interested to find out which one um but they use a fish filter and that's what we talked about uh before it's called ising isling glass or something uh, yeah ising glass or something like that isn't it i think it's made from some kind of uh bladder within the fish yeah uh -huh. so there um, is there is something still happening uh in japan and maybe other beer companies which makes it not vegan so mm. that was the reason we were talking about it uh last time now matthew you have prepared an awesome list for us uh this time and uh, tell us about it yeah, so um, in the warm-up to this, you asked me to, to think of some uh, breweries that I would like to recommend. Uh, and so I've made a list of 10 that all uh, tie into the theme of sustainability uh, in some way. Uh, so I thought we could just go through those uh, geographically from north to south. This isn't a ranking. Now, I'm not going to talk about any specific beers either because that's so personal. You know, everyone likes different beers. I can't really recommend beers to, to other people. 
But these are just breweries that I like, that I have worked with maybe, uh, and that have some connection to, to sustainability in Japan. So I see you're bringing up the first one there. Uh, this is uh, Hop Kotan, which is a, a relatively new brewery there in uh, Hokkaido, in central Hokkaido, uh, in the north of Japan. And I think one of the really interesting things about them is that they are actually located in a hop growing area. It's kind of difficult to grow hops here in Japan, um, but you can grow them up in Hokkaido. And so they are able to use locally grown hops, locally grown ingredients in the beer that they make. I guess that goes back to the authenticity that I was talking about earlier. It looks awesome. I, I love their website here. You're showing the beautiful landscape where they are. And growing your own hops is a big deal because there's not many hops being grown in Japan. Is that right? Yeah, um, there are some. Uh, it's not a huge sector here in Japan. Um, but I think in places where the climate is suitable, uh, hops are grown. Um, but one of the the biggest impediments to impediments to, to us using more Japanese hops is not necessarily the growing, it's the processing. So independent hop growers might be able to grow really fantastic hops here in Japan. Um, but we don't use fresh, wet hops, or even whole dried whole cone hops. Um, we use hop pellets. And I think it's really beyond the ability of any independent hop grower to set up their own hop processing facility. Uh, and so if you're not going to use them whole or fresh or dried, then it's not really practical to use uh, local Japanese hops. So maybe uh, an interesting example to look at here from overseas is New Zealand, which 20, 25 years ago didn't really have a hop industry, but is now world leading. And that's partly due to their fantastic climate and partly due to all the wonderful local hop growers that exist in New Zealand. But it's also partly due to heavy state intervention in setting up state-of-the-art uh, hop processing facilities that are in, owned in common by the hop growers themselves. And that means that they can export their hops all over the world. And we use New Zealand hops sometimes here in the brewery, really fantastic. Wow. So without the ability to process the hops, it's very difficult for us to, to use them at any scale. But I think if Japan could get that together, then the hops grown here could be world famous in the same way that hops from New Zealand are. Because I've come across a, a few uh, farmers who are trying to grow hops because they are craft brew uh, fans themselves and uh, trying to get that going. You mentioned last time that hops needs a lot of water, but it hates humidity. Right, yeah. It's kind of like a catch-22 there. It is a bit, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, there are different varieties, though, and there are varieties that are grown here in Japan that will be more suited to the Japanese climate. Um, I don't think it's impossible to grow really great hops here in Japan. When you look at some of the, um, <clears throat> the agricultural produce that comes out of the country, fantastic. So hops would be no different. As I say, it's the, the processing and the availability of them that's, that's really difficult. You can maybe use fresh hops right after harvest, and some people do do that, but that's a once a year thing, and we need hops all year round. So they need to be dried, pulverized, pelletized, frozen, kept in you know, sub-zero temperatures until we need them. And without proper processing facilities, it's very difficult for independent growers to do that. That makes sense. Um, let's talk about the next one. Be easy. Now they were one of the uh, brands that I love their labels that you had on your Twitter feed. Uh, tell us about be easy. They do really fantastic artwork, don't they? I think they have a few different artists uh, and it's fun to look at the cans and see if you can spot, okay, which artist did this? It was the same one who did this can before. Um, they're up in Hirosaki, which is in Aomori. I actually visited there this year to make a beer together with, with Gareth and with Be Easy. So uh, there is that connection. But when I was up there, um, this is one thing that's a little bit different when you have a brewery that's slightly further out in the countryside, and a little bit more of a rural area. One thing that really impressed me about their facility there was that they would take the, um, the kind of the spent grain, the spent hops, they're basically the byproducts of making beer, 
and they would take those out to a, a field or some fields that were owned by the brewery, use that to improve the soil there, and then grow vegetables in that soil that were then served in the restaurant that was attached to the brewery. So a wonderful example of being able to to turn what could be a waste product into something productive. And of course, that beer is great. Yeah, it looks good. So I, I think what I'm showing here is uh, their connection out to the farms. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they try and use um, local products there as well. Um, some things that some breweries use, uh, one product that some breweries use is something called rice hulls that we will add to the grain when we mash it to, to lighten it up a bit to make it easier to separate the wort from the grain. And for a lot of rice processing facilities, the rice hulls are a waste product. They, they just want to get rid of them, right? It's, it's something that comes off the rice when they're polishing it, cleaning it. And so, <clears throat> sorry, I have a bit of a frog in my throat this morning. And so they are able to take these rice hulls from local rice producers up in our money and put them to good use making delicious beer. I've heard that uh, a bunch of craft breweries uh, seem to give their waste products, uh, like the old the old hops and the barley. The I'm I'm showing my ignorance here. Um, <laughs> the, the to, spent grain, yeah, the spent grain. Spent grain. Spent thank you, thank you. Um, to uh, animal farms for animal food, but also to dig into compost in farms. So that's awesome. That's right. Yeah, um, we actually work together with uh, a local farm to us here in West Tokyo. So um, <clears throat> after the brew day, the farmer will come. We we throw all the, um, the spent grains into some reusable buckets. He takes them to his farm, puts them into the soil, either to, to improve the soil or to, to act as weed suppressant, and then grows vegetables in that soil. Um, they're called base side farms. They're near us here in Tokyo. Uh, and they actually, a little bit of a shout out to them. They do really nice sort of uh, organic vegetable uh, deliveries. You can order a set of organic vegetables from them to be delivered. And I recommend the jalapenos. Very delicious. Oh, that's uh, my husband and my favorite ingredient. Uh, jalapenos, in, really? In okonomiyaki. Ah. If you get okonomiyaki with jalapenos, it's really good. That is so pretty good. Yeah, that's the Hiroshima famous dish, if anyone's wondering. Um, all right, let's talk about Viter, Vertere. Um, if they I were could... one of the beautiful labels that I showed earlier. Yeah, Verter, um, it's uh, based in Okutama, which is slightly further west from us, getting up into the mountains of West Tokyo. It's a really popular hiking spot um, up there. So if you're ever doing some hiking, I very much recommend that you try and finish at Okutama Station because their tap room is located right there. And it's a great way to, to rehydrate after a, a tough day walking in the mountains. Um, but yeah, they make uh, really excellent beer. And as you're showing there, they have a nice tap room with an outside deck looking looking over the river up in Okutama. Beautiful. And a lot of their labels seem to be just nice photographs. Mm. Really, yeah, they have really a, simple, but stylish. Very stylish, I think, yeah. I like it. And uh, Bayside Farm, I found their link here. I'll just quickly show it. Uh, that's the farm that uh, you were talking about just a minute ago. That's right, yeah. We work together with them. They take our spent grain and use it to improve their soil and to make even more delicious vegetables were such a thing possible. That's awesome. Uh, let's continue. AJB? Sure. I think we might have skipped over one briefly, which was ah, uh, Black Tide Brewing. Black Tide. Okay, go ahead. Up in Kesunuma in Miyagi. I think I've tried to go from north to south on these. I was looking at a map. Ah, earlier, okay, sorry, I... sorry. <laughs> I'm I'm skipping around. That's all right. If, if somebody, system. <laughs> if somebody <laughs> is checking on Google Maps and I'm not quite getting the latitudes here right, feel free to, to let me know. <laughs> uh, Black sorry, Tide is that. in uh, Kesunuma, which is in Miyagi Prefecture on the Pacific seaside of Japan. Um, it was actually uh, very badly uh, struck by the tsunami in 2011. Uh, and so Black Tide is part of a local revitalization project. I was there earlier in the year uh, making some beer together with them. And it's part of the, the sort of general redevelopment of the harbor area 
that is going on there. Uh, and I think that's one other positive uh, aspect that craft beer can bring, right? It's not, it's light industry, but it is such that it can be in a fairly built up urbanized area and it can really be uh, an additive process to, to local culture, to bring in tourism, to bring in visitors who are keen on beer or interested in beer uh, and contribute to the local society uh, in that way, as well as by, you know, providing uh, soil improvement to local farmers. That's awesome. Sorry, I'm back on track now. So next mm -hmm. is AJB. Anglo-Japanese Brewing in Nozawa Onsen, uh, Nagano Prefecture. Um, another fantastic brewery. I think it goes without saying that all the all the breweries on this list make great beer. Um, but there was one series of beers in particular that I wanted to highlight from these guys. They had um, something called the Waste to Beer series, which um, I think there were four different varieties, and they all used different upcycled foodstuffs that were scheduled to be discarded. So, for example, uh, grapefruit peels or, you know, the parts of the pineapple that have been cut off during processing, cacao husks, you know, after you, you process the cacao beans, you're left with the husks. They took all these things that were going to be thrown away and they upcycled them into delicious beers. So that was a, a really interesting project that they worked on earlier in this year. Uh, and as a, as a great bonus, the beers were also very delicious. That's awesome. Uh, next, what do we have? A uh, return, which we talked about earlier. Sorry, I skipped ahead. Now we're back to the order, uh, Shio Kaze Brew Lab. That's right. They're in uh, Soga City, which is in Chiba Prefecture, um, just right across Tokyo from us. Um, this is run by my old boss from Bad Brewing. Uh, he was the, uh, the head of the, the production facility there, Chris Poole. Um, and he's uh, he's also moved on from bed and set up his own place in Chiba. I think they have three different tap rooms now uh, spotted around there. Um, if you go to any of their tap rooms, you might notice a certain similarity with our tap room because we had the same carpenter working in both spaces and he has a certain style. And one of the things that he really likes to do is to use uh, recycled wood wherever he can. Uh, and so our countertop here, as well as the countertops in all of their uh, tap rooms use wood that has been reclaimed or, or recycled from various projects. Just That's showing them. some photos here from the Google uh, search page. Um, you can see their tap room there. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, if you do get the chance to make it out to Soga, make sure to, to say hi to Chris. Uh, he's a really great brewer. He can make basically anything uh, and he he loves beers that are as crushable as possible. Make sure to mention to him how crushable all of his beers are. Crushable, what does crushable. that mean? Easy to drink, <laughs> it's easy to drink basically. Crushing a beer means just throwing it back in one gulp. Uh, and so the more crushable it is, the easier it is to drink. Now, I am not even gonna attempt to say the next one, you go for it. Idrisil, Idrisil. Uh, Norse mythology, this is the world tree in Norse mythology. This brewery is in Hiratsuka, Kanagawa. It's run by a French guy who is really into heavy metal music. So you may notice a, a certain Norse or Viking theme to a lot of their branding. But um, one really interesting thing about them, about Idrisil, is that they, it's very common in Japan to use uh, American hops. Um, they only use European hops as far as I'm aware, mostly French hops, to be honest. So they try and use all French or European ingredients, um, which gives the beer, you can definitely taste it. It has a, a different character and a very Idrisil character. You can taste the beer and say, yeah, this this tastes like one of theirs. Um, they also have a, a tap room down there in, in Hiratsuka, which has just a really nice connection to the local community. I think whenever I've been in there, it's the kind of place that people might bring their kids for some dinner on the way home. And uh, I know that people are football crazy uh, in that area as well. So they have a really great connection with um, with their local community. Now, what they just shared, was that like a different brand? Was that a fashion brand? Uh, I'm uh, not sure what that was to be fair. I'll, I'll have to double check that. So uh, yeah, that was cool. 
Um, but maybe I didn't see any beer. So we'll double check on that link next time. <laughs> I'll make sure and put the right link below. Sorry about that. Um, WCB next. Yeah, West Coast Brewing, who are in Shizuoka City, Shizuoka. Um, I have to include these guys. Uh, no list of craft beers in Japan would be complete without them. Um, I don't think it's a controversial thing to say that they make the best beer in Japan. Uh, it's it's kind of the brand that the rest of us aspire to. And it's amazing. They've only been around for about three or four years. I went to their anniversary event this year. Uh, it feels like, you know, they're, they're such a, a mainstay, such a fixture in the craft beer scene here. But they are a relatively new company, uh, craft beer speaking. That being said, there has been a, a real boom in new breweries being opened over the last two to three years, I think. Uh, and so making it to, to three or four years, maybe that does qualify you as an elder statesman of the industry. Very cool. Um, do you you have their beers on tap or in cans or? Uh, yeah, a bit of both sometimes. We do like their can art. I see the one you've got on the top left there. That's a collaboration they did with uh, Kyoto Brewing in uh, in Kyoto. I had a can of that last night and it was excellent. Um, they always have really interesting can art. Uh, and when we can, we do like to have some of their beer on tap as well. When you can. I like it is, that. Oh, oh, God. <laughs> it's Monday morning, JJ. I, I think I need another sip of coffee here. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, with the craft brewery, a whole industry you've got so many play on words that you can do it's awesome that's the only reason we, any of us get into this game is to come up with silly names for the beer that's the whole point <laughs> the whole point of owning a brewery right yeah i love all the the art and do you do you and a lot of the breweries do they use local artists like people they know um onomichi brewery Whenever I pop in, they always say that their labels were just like a local guy who was doodling at their bar. And they're like, you got to start making our labels. You know, it's awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly, but I would think that is often the case. Um, often craft beer breweries like us are relatively small operations. We don't have a big global reach and we're certainly not, you know, going to, to world famous uh, artists for our can art. So we do tend to reach out to our local community and see if there are any people who are interested in doing a little bit of design work, who would be interested in doing some art. Um, the space behind me actually that currently has all the t-shirts hanging up is our uh, art exhibition space. So we don't have anybody this month, but uh, every month we try and host uh, a local artist. It's completely free to use. Uh, and it's a nice way for us to have so some new art in the tap room every month. And it's a nice way for uh, maybe an up and coming artist, somebody who hasn't got a lot of exhibitions under their belt to, to get their work in front of people. That's awesome. Do you ever sell them as well? Because uh, the one time I bought art as a student without money was at a free wine event where they also had <laughs> art. Um, so I imagine drinking lots of alcohol and selling art goes very well together. I would imagine so, yeah. I'm going to show my age here, but I remember the record shop in Edinburgh when I was growing up would also serve alcohol and, uh, you know, have a few beers. And suddenly that record seems, you know, I'm practically making money here. This is going to be an investment. Um, but yeah, we, we, of course, the artists are free to sell their work if they want to. We don't get involved in that at all. But um, you can put up a link. You can uh, direct people to your store page, whatever you want. Uh, if you are an artist and you are looking for a place to exhibit work, Please get in touch with us. We're always looking for, for people to, to 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 exhibit in this space. That's awesome. Uh, next, Totopia. Totopia. Uh, it's on the outskirts of Nagoya. So we're getting further down south now. Um, they make uh, all kinds of beers. They're quite famous for their hazy IPAs. But um, the, the thing that they make that I'm the biggest fan of is dry hopped sours. Do you like sour beer, JJ? You know. I have had some sour beer that I really like and some sour beer that I hated, but I keep trying. It's like, you know, like all craft beer, you you got to try new things. Absolutely. If you click on that black label there, you might uh, see okay. um, one of their dry hopped sours. Uh, what has this one got in it? 
uh, mango, cherry, pineapple, key lime, marshmallow, and vanilla. It's quite a lineup, isn't it? Mm. Um, yeah, they, they make really excellent beer, but um, that's just part of the reason why I wanted to highlight them. The other part was, uh, this is a quote from their website, from their homepage, actually. They said, above all, our mission is not only size growth. So I think that's quite common in the craft beer industry, actually. Uh, and maybe something that doesn't get talked about a lot, but a, a lot of breweries are just owned by, you know, local business people like us, by, by the brewers themselves, very honest. And we're not venture capitalists. We're not looking for a, a quick payout. We're not looking to extract money from our local communities. We're looking to be, you know, a positive thing to our local community, to be, you know, just a, a place where people can come together and can enjoy beer and build relationships. But also, and I think part of sustainability is offering sustainable employment to your local community. You know, we, we have staff here, we try to pay them well, we try to hire from the local community. And one of the questions that I would ask about breweries or really any kind of business is, where does the money go? And if you're running a, a successful business, hopefully you're making money. Where's that money going? Is it going back into your community? Or is it going to buy some billionaire his fourth yacht? You know, and I think that's part of the reason why I would encourage people to support local craft breweries is because they will invest that money back in the communities that they operate in rather than pulling it out into shareholder value uh, or some other very abstract notion of value. Absolutely. And a little shout out to Lawson here, because I think Lawson is the only of the convenience stores that has craft beer. And I'm hoping they will expand their range because it's usually only two, sometimes three. Um, but why aren't convenience stores selling more craft beer? It's booming in Japan, right? Mm. That's a good question. Yeah, it's definitely a product that consumers want. So why is that need not being fulfilled? Um, you don't see it in that many supermarkets either. Uh, and I think the answer is actually just a practical one. Um, most craft beer has to be cold chain shipped from producer to consumer. It can't be allowed to get warm, even to room temperature at any point. Well, that's really going to ruin the the character that you're paying for in that can and a lot of uh convenience stores supermarkets just don't have the facility to keep packaged beer uh cold before they sell it right you see the stuff on the shelf and usually it should be in the, the cold section but what about the stuff in the back the stuff that's waiting to go on the shelf they often don't have the facility back there to keep that stuff cold uh, and so i think that is partly maybe one of the reasons why you're not seeing it more commonly. That's a really interesting point. I didn't think about that, the cold supply chain yep. uh, requirement. Really interesting. Now we don't wanna finish without uh, finishing our list. Uh, we have Hino Brewery here. That's right, Hino Brewing, um, which is in Shiga Prefecture as well. Um, again, a, a brewery that I visited this year, uh, probably the most rural brewery I have visited to date. Um, when I was talking to them about the business trip, I asked, oh, do you have any recommendations for hotels in the town? And they said, well, there is only one hotel in the town, so <laughs> we recommend that one. Um, but one thing that I uh, want to call out from them is that, of course, they make excellent beer, but also their brewery is, um, it is a recycled, reused, defunct brewery that was already in existence there. Um, there is something in their town, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but it's kind of a German theme park. And during the bubble period, whoever set up this theme park also installed a brewery as part of the German experience, I suppose. Uh, but it had kind of fallen out of use and it was just sitting empty. It wasn't being used by anybody. So when they set up in the area, they happened to talk to these people who said, well, Instead of buying a new brewery, why don't you use this one? And 
you know, it's, it's very expensive to buy brewing equipment, but it also takes a lot of resources. There's a lot of steel involved. There's a lot of electricity, a lot of energy involved. So reusing, recycling an existing brew house, you know, repurposing it to make your beer, I thought was a really excellent example of sustainability in action. Absolutely. And am I looking at a wooden keg or wooden brewer, brewing machine maker? Uh I think that was a uh, copper, copper clad oh, copper. Uh, okay. kettle. Yeah. This uh, one. Yeah, that's right. Yes, that's copper rather than wood. And that tap on the front, uh, I when I first saw that, I thought that was a sink for washing your hands. Actually, that's not. That's part of the brewing system and beer comes out of that tap. Perfect. Oh, wait, wait, I have to go back to it. Oh, the, the tap. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it looks like a hand washing sink, doesn't it? That's what I assumed yeah. it was. No, no. It yeah, does. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that list. And of course, there's many others uh, that you would recommend and you often do uh, around Japan mm -hmm. as well. But that's that's excellent. And I think the points that you made about why craft breweries um, are often more sustainable and supporting the local economy. is so it's so important to remember a reason to dive into craft beer mm -hmm. and not just settle for what's at your local supermarket or the one that everybody buys because it's the cheapest or you know like there's so much flavor diversity it's one of the the amazing things great artwork but also that community support it's a big part of it absolutely yeah and um you're talking about flavor diversity it is very fun when people come into our tap room we have a, a couple of different seasonal beers on at the moment one of them is a a chocolate orange porter which is very rich, very dark. Chocolate orange is a classic British Christmas taste. So that's yeah. one of our seasonal beers. Uh, we also have uh, a raspberry Berliner Weiss, which is a sour beer. Uh, and that's quite white, quite fruity, quite zippy. Uh, and sometimes, you know, a couple will come to the bar and they'll order one of each. And then you, you see these two things on the bar. One of them is kind of a very dark black color. And the other one is uh, a light, a light pink color. They're next to each other, and you have to think, no, these are the essentially the same thing. These are both beer, but they're at such opposite ends of the, the beer spectrum. I don't know if there's any other drink that has such variety contained within it as beer. Yeah. Well, you were, I think last time you were talking about uh, pushing the limits of what you would call beer because something had milk and sugar and strawberries in it, like a strawberry milkshake or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if I would call that crushable, but it is uh, certainly very delicious. <laughs> now, uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about last time was how popular the high alcohol content beers were is that still true at your tap room um yes yeah i think it is um if we look to uh well my home country the uk i think that uh low alcohol or no alcohol beers uh, are gaining in popularity um you tend not to see those in japan uh certainly not from small producers like us um and you also don't really see very many imported non-alcoholic beers, do you? Um, I, apparently one of the reasons for this is that non-alcoholic beer is considered uh, a foodstuff rather than an alcohol under Japanese law. And so it needs to be, the can needs to be pasteurized at quite a high temperature for a long period of time. It's not completely without merit. I mean, without the alcohol in there to keep it safe to drink, that is something you, you do need to do. Um, I'm getting off topic a little bit, but um, in Japan, uh, in the tap room in here, it is my experience that people who don't know what they're looking for will will notice special things about the beer. And that could be the fact that it has raspberry in it. That could be the fact that it has a funny name. We have a beer on at the moment called Ohio Gazimus, you mentioned earlier. Um, and it could be the fact that it is very strong. So, you know, beer can go up to 10, 12, 13%. We probably wouldn't be serving that in pints but it is something that people notice when they come into the tap room and it will catch their attention because it's it's out with their usual beer drinking experience for a, a glass of beer to be that strong. That's wild. Now, part of your training was with a sake brewery as well. 
And something I've noticed uh, with some craft breweries recently is they're combining sake kasu in their craft beer. Mm. Or there was a place in Tohoku in Fukushima that I visited and it's a sake brewery, but they're really mixing the process of making craft beer and sake in it's a very interesting flavor profiles. Um, it's quite exciting to see from Japan because we're we're noticing that a lot of sake breweries are kind of struggling and uh, young drinkers especially are looking for more variety or more flavor uh, diversity, for example. Have, mm. you, have you seen any of those? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I think they're both brewing processes uh, and there are some similarities. There are also some differences, but um, I think there could be some very interesting crossover, some very interesting uh, mixing going on. It tends to come from the sake industry to the beer industry. I and mean, that tends to be the direction of movement. But um, I was talking to another local bar owner here um, quite recently, and he was thinking about things in the opposite direction. He had the very interesting idea of getting some sake and adding hops to it, dry hops. And what would happen with that? I don't really know. It could be extremely delicious. You'd need to choose the right hops. You might even need to carbonate the sake to get that uh, aroma to come out properly. But it would be interesting to see this kind of cross-pollination of ideas move in the other direction as well. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so you've you've changed so much. You now have your own brewery. Uh, you can stay open. Last time we talked, you were just about to shut down. You had to sell all the beers that you had on keg and the local community rallied and was able to do it. That was awesome. Um, but what's on the horizon for Sakamichi Brewing? Do you have anything coming up you could tell us about? I think uh, that clear the board event that we had before we had to close is probably still one of my favorite events that we've ever done. Um, just to, to hark back to that for a moment, we, we were going to have to shut down for a couple of months. We didn't know how long we had all this draft beer in the fridge and we wanted to finish it. So we had a big party. We invited everybody and we said, if you finish a keg, you get a round of applause and a free sticker. And, um, the local community certainly responded. They, they came together to drink lots of beer and to work hard for us. So that was, it was a really fun event and it was really great to see the support that we had built up in the local community. Um, looking forwards, uh, I think this year was the first year that we really saw the return of a lot of uh, outdoor beer events. Those kind of got shut down a bit during the, the unpleasantness as well. Um, so we were able to participate in, I think, seven or eight events this year. It would be really great to maybe even participate in, in more next year or even potentially to organize some of our own events. You know, I think um, I mentioned earlier that there's been a real growth in craft beer over the last year or two. Uh, and even in our area, there are new breweries opening up all the time. Uh, and despite the growth in the, the industry, there's still a long way to go. So we're all still in the sort of the phase where we're supporting each other and trying to come together. So it'd be fantastic to, to get together with local breweries, to, to collaborate, to make interesting new beers, to share ideas, um, to share education. And um, yeah, and to, to run events to provide that beer to the people. I think um, the, the one thing that we can't ever lose sight of as beer makers is that at the end of the day, somebody has to drink it. If, if nobody drinks the beer, then everything else we're doing is completely pointless. And so getting it into to people's glasses and getting it into people's hands is really the key step in making beer. That's awesome. Uh, one thing I, I was so happy to see in Onomichi, Onomichi Brewery is quite a uh, new uh, business there run by an amazing couple who reinvented their lives coming from Tokyo and setting up in rural Hiroshima, creating great beer. And they've won awards uh, for some of their beers. But one thing that really warms my heart is when I visit Onomichi and I see local restaurants, local cafes selling their beer. And so you were talking about collaborating with eateries and supporting what they do, but it's really great to see vice versa, right? You have a craft brewery in your town, uh, start offering it at your eatery or cafe. And that's, that's wonderful collaboration to see as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mentioned that I was at, uh, Mount Takao, Takao San yesterday. There's a really great, um, 
burger slider place there called uh, Takara Mountain House. Uh, and I was very pleased to also see three of our beers on tap there. It's great. It's always great when I see our beer in the wild or if I see somebody wearing one of our T-shirts in the wild. It's always a really fantastic feeling to see that. It must feel so good because you work so hard making it, right? The first time I saw somebody wearing a Sakamichi t-shirt was here in Tachikawa. I was crossing the road and he was coming the other way. Um, I saw the t-shirt and waved to him. I was wearing a mask and a hat and he had no idea who I was. He just thought I was some lunatic foreigner trying to accost him in the street. <laughs> but, but what a great story. And hopefully he found out who you were later and then he waves at you next time. You maybe, know, you maybe know. so, yes. You let's let's leave that one on a positive note. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Matthew, for joining once again. I can't believe it's been two years since we talked the first time. Uh, so many great insights today from your list of more sustainable breweries to check out in Japan. I will try my best to put the correct links all below uh, and hopefully you can help me with that. Um, but if you're watching this on replay, uh, make sure to write your comments or questions below. We had some great comments and questions today. It sounds like people not even in Japan. Uh, who joined us. So uh, thank you so much for joining and for commenting. It was great to have you on again. Thank you very much for having me, JJ. Hopefully it won't be two years until we speak the next time. But uh, yeah, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you this morning. That's awesome. And my uh, bucket list aim for next year is to get there to your Sakamichi Brewing myself, sit at the bar and drink some of your brews. I would love that. A, a live in-person recording even. That would be fun, wouldn't it? Well, that we're open every day from 12. Fun. We're open every Maybe day from 12. Maybe we can 12. get the Bean Pod Casey to come over and join us at the bar. Wouldn't that and be some other local podcasters. That'd be so fun. That would be great, <laughs> yes. All right. Thanks so much, Matthew. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. See you next time. Thank you. can't get over the sound of our own voices some of us come around just to lend an ear don't ever change i love you just the way you are so so far.